We'll start with Oded Netzer and David Schwedel, um, who will present um, from their team on capturing marketing information to fuel growth. And we'll follow that with the commentary um, from Jason Wilde, the SVP at, of Innovation at Salesforce, and then we'll take your questions. So, um, Odette and David, please take, take, take over. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody, for uh, joining. And actually, thank you the first session for uh, such an interesting discussion around agility. In fact, um, a lot of what we do in, in this uh, initiative is are some of maybe of the early stages of that. How do we actually think about data and information in order to drive uh, such uh, agile behavior? Um, uh, do, can you see my screen well? Uh, yeah, great. Uh, so this is uh, based on, again, uh, Chris mentioned uh, earlier on, based on this MSI initiative. Uh, uh, MSI scholars were writing papers around the priorities, the MSI priorities, and uh, the four of us, uh, Rex Du, myself, David Schwedel, and uh, Deb Mitra, um, decided to, to uh, look at the problem of uh, capturing marketing information to fuel uh, growth, uh, which was a, a topic that is dear to our heart because all four of us are empirical researchers. All four of us have been working with what we saw big data, and then we later we realized that now it's small data, and there is another data that is bigger than that, and, and have been in this area of analyzing data and thinking about how can data lead to a better business decision making uh, in different ways. All, actually, all four of us are, came from very different perspectives at, at this, uh, this problem. And I think by now it's fair to say that we are all um, – survivors, if you will, of the era of big data, capital B, capital D, right? We all have went through the hype as well as the realization of what is the promise of, of big data and, and what can be there. It's still ha some of it is still happening, but I think the dust is starting to settle around what is real hype and what is real value of, of big data. We started with, I think I now understand better, and maybe relative to five years ago where everything was around, again, the capital B and the capital D of big data. And, and that's where, where I think this, this um, idea and this priority from MSI came about around, it's not about the, the data or, or the size of the data, it's actually about uh, how are we going to use it to link it to, to, firms growth, to, to firms' growth. We are not collecting data for the purpose of data, we're not uh, um, collecting data for the purpose of fancy analysis. At, at the end of the day, we want to make better decisions and help the firm grow. And that's exactly where, where um, this paper is, is focused on. And what we identified is a gap, <laughs> a gap uh, by which we see that firms are spending often uh, an increase of, you know, 50% or north of 50% in the investment in, in, in data, in analytics, and so on. But actually, when you look at firms' growth, it by no means grows at anywhere close to the level of investment in uh, analytics and many firms are expressing in the, the CMO survey are expressing um, struggle with are we actually spending the money in the right place? What is happening with this gap between how much we are moving with analytics and how much we are seeing more on the other side of it in terms of the outcome and, and, and the benefit for um, and investing in data analytics? And again, that's exactly where we um, start to, to, to focus on. And uh, we, we went actually through several iterations of thinking about why is this gap happening? Where, what are the sources of this gap? And, and we had different uh, um, views on what could be uh, the reason. And I don't think we by any means uh, covered all of this. And actually, I think Jason would actually highlight uh, maybe a, another dimension of it. But one of the directions that we have identified was a street light effect. A street light effect in which um, companies are collecting often data for the purpose of data, for the data that is e most easily available, for the data that is the shiniest data in terms of, you know, the, 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 the web 2.0, the web 3.0, the social media, I want to make sure, I mean, this type of data and another type of data, and not necessarily asking themselves, what data do I need in order to grow the firm? What data do I need in order to make better business decisions? Uh, questions are often being asked along the lines of, Oh, we have all of these troves of data. Let's get our data scientists look at them and see if there is any any nuggets in the data, right? As opposed to starting from here are problems we are struggling with. Let's find the, the, what is the data that could help us, whether it's the perfect data or or not. And as we looked at the streetlight effect, actually we identified that um, 
if you if you look historically at important um, data revolutions, if you will, in the past, each one of them generated not only benefits, and they definitely did, they also generated with them blind spots that come because of the spirit like effect. And I want to uh, highlight a few. I'm sure many of you uh, will be able to come up with your favorite example of blind spots of data. Let's start with 1983, Gudani Little, right? I mean, wrote this seminal paper bringing both to the academic field and later IRI and, and so on, uh, the notion of scanner panel data, right? That they, what we can do if we can observe purchases of consumers, purchases of uh, competitors, we can observe all of these uh, interactions. Again, led to years, in fact, between, I would say, 1983 and, and the early 2000s, almost every empirical academic paper was using that data, right? A lot of insights that came out of this, and, and, and till today, uh, the data is extremely useful. But it came with a blind spot, and it came with a blind, blind spot of myopic thinking, of thinking about short-term promotions, right? Because we could analyze for the first time pricing and promotion. But it led us to maybe shy away from thinking about advertising because it did not exist in the data. For more, maybe more of the long-term brand building type of effect that uh, um, we may be left behind because suddenly we had good data on short-term effects and less so on long-term effects. Let's go to the next uh, um, revolution. Early 90s, again, Jason would be able to tell us much more about this uh, around CRM data. Huge revolution, right, to, to the world of and customer centricity, thinking about customers, collecting data about customers, allowed us to, to um, really target better customers and think about notions like customer lifetime value. But it came again with a blind spot, and, the bl and, the, and at least two of the blind spots that it came with. First, most CRM data is only internal, which may uh, uh, cause us to, to uh, underestimate and underappreciate competitive reactions. It's also often backward looking, which may uh, um, prevent us from really looking, uh, looking into the future. Clickstream data. So now we're moving in time, we're early 2000, that's when clickstream data arrived, right? Uh, again, led to beautiful insights in terms of things like uh, effectiveness of advertising, digital advertising. But because we could suddenly, for the first time, measure advertising, right? The, the old statement of half of my advertising is well spent, I don't know which half. Suddenly we got the, click the impression that actually we can measure advertising. By the way, another uh, uh, JM paper uh, from exactly the same series tackles that issue of digital advertising. We, we forgot that the fact that we can measure it doesn't mean we should manage it. Meaning, what about the um, non-digital touch points? They could be equally efficient, just harder to, to, to uh, measure. The fact that we can measure them doesn't, seem that, doesn't mean they're not effective. So think about... a. Uh, Offline advertising, yes, it's harder to measure. It doesn't mean it's less effective than a measurable digital advertising. And picture data could possibly overfocus on, on the measurable type of advertising. Field experiment, online testing, again, beautiful source of data that allows us to assess causality in many places, but also led to short-term focus on the things that we can manipulate. Advertising websites, it's much harder to manipulate channels of distribution. Does that mean that because of that we will uh, um, change less the, panel, uh, the channels of distribution because it's harder to manipulate, right? So could lead to a blind spot on places that are maybe difficult to assess uh, uh, causal relationships. At uh, UGC, I did a lot of my research, you know, now we are 2005, circa 2005 is when UGC arrived to uh, our world in terms of being able to measure it and so on. But we forgot that actually there is a lot of selection bias there. It's very particular people who share UGC. And again, later, later studies, research, for example, David will, will um, um, share with me this presentation. I uh, did some research on the selection bias that comes with it. So again, a blind spot that came with a beautiful source of data. And finally, the last example I'll, I'll mention is um, big data and machine learning. Great predictive tool and, and, and can lead to, to a, really valuable uh, actions if your goal is prediction, but in focusing on that, sometimes we are forgetting the, the theory that comes with it as well as uh, algorithmic bias that may happen because of these uh, great prediction uh, machines. So with, with, with these biases and with these blind spots, we turn to ask ourselves, so how do, we, how do we fix it? How do we align companies between collecting data and firm growth and uh, David will take us through the link that we have actually uh, suggested in order to, to try and align 
a firm growth together with uh, expecting data. Thanks a lot, Oded. And so the framework that we leaned into was the customer equity framework. And if we think about the components that comprise this framework, there's going to be the customer acquisition piece, the relationship development piece, and ultimately the customer retention piece. And so we can think about how data can drive growth as how can data enable us to be more efficient or to perform better on any one of these three dimensions, and ultimately that's going to translate into a change in, in customer equity. Right, so whether that means in, uh, improving customer acquisition or you know, that's going to drive customer equity, and conversely, if we do a lousy job, our retention goes down, that's ultimately going to hurt customer equity. And so just being mindful of the time that we have, I'm going to um, – you know, just introduce some of the data sources that we had identified that you know, we believe have been overlooked uh, at least uh, at present and could potentially provide big opportunities for companies as far as being incorporated into their decision making and driving growth. Um, and so the first of those potential data sources is the use of social network data. And you know, as I'll talk about momentarily, learning about the social network doesn't just mean looking at it from the perspective of social media. But if we return back to customer equity, customer equity typically thinks about the, consumer, the customer in terms of his or her individual behavior, not where we fit in within the entire social graph. And so this could have big implications as far as how we allocate resources across customers. You know, another opportunity that we see with uh, social network data from a customer acquisition standpoint is which of these prospects do we think we're going to be paying uh, more attention to, investing more in, not because they necessarily provide the most revenue for us, but because of the network externalities, the additional people they may bring with them. Right? Uh, another opportunity that we potentially see uh, is how do we get this data? So, you know, is it worthwhile for every company to try to undertake this effort on their own? Or is there an opportunity for another innovative company to come into the space to help us flesh out the social network, become that third-party data source that other businesses are going to rely upon? All right. So the other source of data that um, yeah, I think has the potential to aid on the customer acquisition side is location data. Uh, the video, I don't know if it's how well it's going to work, but we'll take a shot. This is from the New York Times, and it's the mobile device pings from the day of the Capitol riot. Um, and you see the mass movement of people from the White House toward uh, the U.S. Capitol. And so with location data, yes, there's the opportunity to, to track people with incredible precision, potentially more precision than we might like. Um, but, you know, at, it, incumbent with that are some risks. But what could we potentially do with this? Not only can we get engaged in targeted marketing, we can do a better job of measuring our campaigns. We can potentially do a much better job in terms of targeting customers based on what they're doing with our firm as well as other firms. And some of the work that we've started to explore is to what extent um, is location data something that can be used for inferring the entire social network. Uh, you know, another source of data that we think presents a lot of opportunity um, is the use of trend data. And so, you know, we can see Twitter ha tells us what's trending, Google search tells us what's trending. But what trend data provides is an external perspective uh, to complement the internal data that businesses readily have available to them. And so some of the key issues that we believe exist it, are going to be separating trends from fads, uh, merging different data sources to inform uh, product de uh, development decisions and figuring out how do we em engage in uh, the distribution or, or how do we try to ride the wave of a trend in terms of the geographic distribution that might be playing out. So how something spreads around the world or within a particular country. So, Odette, if you want to take us through just the last piece of the data. Sure. Sure. Uh, so, so uh, another di direction, again, we mentioned that one of the blind spots of CRM data has been competitive uh, data, thinking about what the competitors are doing. Share of wallet is a great example of that, right? I mean, we, we all agree that we all understand how understanding share of wallets could lead to, to firm growth, right, directly related to the customer equity framework, how much is our, our customers uh, buying in, in, uh, in our competitors or how much of the wallet is allocated to competitors, very little work actually has been done on trying to identify innovative sources of data like clickstream, like a location data that can 
in, allow us to infer share of all the data, for example, or impute competitive marketing action. We can use, again, a clickstream data, for example, to understand uh, how likely is our, our customers to be exposed to um, uh, our competitors' marketing actions. And, and often what, that would need, what we need to do in order to, to do that is synthesizing different sources of data. Um, going back to, maybe to the last pillar of customer equity retention, right? This, I believe that this is one of the biggest gaps in utilization of data these days, is our customers' conversations. We are spending billions of dollars sending, sending advertisers to customers, thinking about the phone, thinking about the background, thinking about every single detail in the, in the messages we send to customers. And then the customer calls us back. And what do we do with it? We send it offshore and we never listen to it, right? And again, some companies do, but most companies rarely listen to customers' uh, conversations. Uh, part of it is because of the difficulty that the data tends to be unstructured. It tends to be voice and text and uh, audio type data, sometimes video type data. And there is a lot that can be gained uh, if we learn how to listen, right? We, for example, try, can, can try to not only predict whether a customer churn, which is more, what most companies do, but actually predict why would the customer churn? Because if you understand why, then we can maybe save the customer. I mean, doctors rarely are predicting whether a, a, a patient will, will die. They're, they're trying to predict why, why were they may die, right? If we as businesses take that approach and conversation can get to there, we have higher chances of saving these customers. A, another very interesting part or, or aspect of these customer conversations are often diet. We have an agent and we have a customer. And understanding the interaction between them can be particularly important and specifically if we are going to do it along the dimensions of understanding emotions on both sides of, of that conversation. So to, to, to wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about one last slide around challenges, and that's also a good segue to, to Jason's uh, um, section. Uh, it's maybe easier said than done. There is a reason why the gap exists, right? Um, one, one managerial challenge is that we actually do not fully uh, appreciate or understand what is the incremental value of, of, of investing in data? We don't really, it's very hard to put dollar value on the investment in data, and that's one of the reasons why firms are reluctant to do so. And we talked about the location data and, for example, ethical and legal uh, costs or issues that may arise with that came up also in agility, a quite obvious uh, challenge there. And we tend to focus on um, unicorns or the largest companies, right, that, that already mature in the analytics curve. But uh, we should also focus on companies that are early on in this stage and what does it mean for them, right, companies that are just starting to adopt uh, data and uh, analytics. And, and we know from examples such as Moneyball, right, that investment in data can pay off, but uh, it's very hard to sustain the competitive advantage. Soon enough, your competitors are going to uh, jump on the same bandwagon. And obviously, an, another important challenge that I think Jason is going to talk about is the developing the skills and the, the talent within the organization. So um, with that, I mean, I think it's great to hear from academics talking about it, but uh, it's much more interesting to hear from a company that has a lot of data, a Salesforce. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop here and uh, pass it off to Jason. <laughs>